Oh, you weren't picking your nose, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was really hoping that I would catch you off guard and you'd be pick- That's how that's how the Friday Bean starts. We're professional over at the E Rank channel, but here you guys get coffee and boogers. Um happy Friday. Mark is here. I promised. I didn't I didn't murder him. Um actually he almost murdered me this morning. Christina got to listen to him on just raging out because nothing worked this morning. Everything was messed up. So he's he's over there. You want to say hi? Mr. Moore? Mr. M- 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 Mr. Moore, you want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> the stream's 30 seconds behind over here. I'm making sure everything sounds Oh, good. okay. <laughs> He's just listening through headphones. So, guys, happy Friday. Welcome to the Friday Bean. Obviously, we have Christina Nicole here, and she's going to be answering some questions from you guys related to product photography. Normally, Mark is the one to read the questions, so you're going to have to be patient with me. Um, You know what would be awesome is when everybody has a question, if you type the word question before your question, (laughs) and then I'll be able to find them easier. Go easy on me. I'm not normally the one to do this uh, on my own. But before we get started, I do have a couple announcements. Uh, The main one, Christina, you messaged me, uh, what, this morning, and you're like, no, we should talk about this before we talk about product photos seem like a a minuscule thing next to the news that you guys probably saw, you know, yesterday, especially if this news pertains to you. So we'll get that out of the way, and then we'll jump into the photo fun. But um, basically yesterday... I finally heard back from Etsy's head of customer support. Um, For those who weren't aware, I've been in communication with him. This is all kind of related to our Keep Etsy Human movement. A lot of the sellers who have been deactivated wrongfully, um, who have appealed their shop deactivations and have been denied and basically told, like, you can't even message us back. Like, It's infuriating, and so many people have felt alone. So I've worked my way through this chain and finally reached Etsy's head of customer support, who basically has asked me for a short list of sellers who have been um, affected by the deactivation so that the team can start looking into them. Well, 200 emails later, um, (laughs) we have a bit more than a short list. Um, So if you guys have emailed me, about a deactivation, please be aware that I'm not going to be able to reply to all of you, but that does not mean that you're not included to the case. It's going to be me, Mark, and my virtual assistant, Michelle, all weekend having to organize this list. And it's only been, what, like 16 hours, I think, um, that I've even had this call to action out there. So just be patient with us. What we're trying to do is not just get shops reactivated who have been wrongfully deactivated, but also promote overall change on the platform. It's going to be a slow process, but please be patient with us. This is the most traction that we've made since last August when we first started our Keep Etsy Human movement. So I'm going to do everything that I can. Just please be aware that I don't work for Etsy. I've had a lot of emails that have said, like, you're my only hope. And that makes me really sad because it's almost like this is a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, I'm 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 gonna do what I can, but I'm not Etsy. I don't get to pick, um, but I am doing everything in my power to make this happen. So um, I will try to keep you guys informed on the Friday Bean each week. So just tune in on Fridays, and if there are any big, giant, major announcements, I will email you guys. Um, And if you're not on my email list, you know, if you just sent me an email because you saw the post on Facebook, that's not being on my email list. I'm not going to go through and email each of you individually. There's a bunch of free stuff down below in the video description. If you sign up for any of that, you'll land on my email list. And then if there's an update, you'll get an email about it or just, you know, hang out every week on Fridays and we'll try to cover it before we start each Friday. But let's go ahead and get on to our fun topic with uh, with Christina. Um, Christina, do you want to tell the alphas who weren't, you know, here or over at E-Rank yesterday who you are and what you do and why you're so special? <laughs> I am special. Uh, thanks for having me again on the channel. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here, answer your guys' questions about product photography. Uh, my name is Christina Nicole. 
And I have been a photographer for over 20 years. It's just been a passion, a hobby of mine. I love taking photos. I started out as a portrait photographer doing families, newborns, all that jazz. And then in 2015, I actually started my own product-based business. I am a woodworker. And after a few years, the, the business just wasn't really serving the life that I wanted. And as a maker and being part of the maker community, I saw such a huge need for a you know photography coach that would actually teach you guys how to take product photos with the equipment the camera and all of that that you already have so simple inexpensive solutions versus you know the professionals out there saying that you have to buy a dslr camera or huge artificial light setup so we work with simple and expensive and it's my favorite thing i love it <laughs> that's awesome and you know what's funny i'm glad that you that you mentioned what you make or what you made uh, in your in your first shop because yesterday after Q&A at E Rank I was sitting there and I'm like what did she make cuz we were friends before <laughs> you were you know doing pr uh, product photography coaching and before I was a coach when I was still selling jewelry but I was trying to think back and I'm like you know I can't even remember what she sold what what specifically was it so I started with like wood signs, but interesting enough, because you always talk about like niching down, right? Like I wanted to be super unique. I wanted to do something different. So I created like these weird boho signs out of all those different like weird things like floor mats and I can't even describe it. It was weird. And <laughs> nobody was searching for it, right? So like I wasn't making making sales because nobody was searching for it. So. I started doing the trend research, all that kind of stuff. Anyways, weddings, establishment signs, huge industry. So doing a lot of establishment signs, but honestly, we loved making like just wood, wood decor in general. So like candles, all kinds of different stuff. But then my husband and I really got into building furniture and we became really passionate about that side of it. And we still do that component. Like we love building furniture. A lot of the furniture in our house we made. And so basically establishment signs. Those are my best sellers. Awesome. Yeah, that's, I, I I had no idea, but I can definitely see how after a while, especially when you're passionate about something else, how that could be time consuming. Because I kind of have a similar story with creating, you know, my jewelry. And mm -hmm. yes, it, every, everybody's like, why did you, uh, why did you, uh, abandon your top 1% shop, you were making six figures. And it's like, I hit like the cap, not just on my capabilities, but also my mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to school to be a teacher. Like I, I've been, I've wanted to teach my entire life. It's just being a teacher doesn't pay worth a squat. And any teachers in the chat can confirm that you got to really, really love teaching kids to be able to teach kids um, because it's not an, an it's not a pay incentive there and I also wanted to survive so um, I started working at E-Rank I started making YouTube tutorials and, and then that's kind of how I got into coaching um, and then I made a more scalable shop mm -hmm. later on so um, guys what we're going to be discussing today is product photography I know that a couple of you have kind of you know gotten a couple comments into the chat but if you have any specific questions for christina you have plenty of time to ask i did want to start though uh prim heirloom designs said okay anyone who is here and has not tried christina's light challenge or enrolled in the maker's method is missing out she's a phenomenal instructor and her courses are such a great value um that's one of the reasons why christina is here this week christina up until Sunday, we'll have registration open for her light challenge, which I actually took last year. And I, I'm hoping that you guys can see a noticeable difference in my photography since then, because I think it's so much better uh, for my own Etsy shop. There was so much I didn't know. I didn't. I. You guys know that starting out, if you've been a subscriber to my channel for a long time, I used to sit like out on my porch and take photos. But I always had issues because we're, I'm right under a tree and I always had like green from the tree above me and I would go in and have to edit all the green out of my product photos. And now I feel like I have skills that for one, don't require me to edit my photos, um, which has saved me so much time. 
but I've also learned better habits that I'm going to be using forever. I mean, I, I it's things that I don't even have to think about anymore because now I already know how to do them. So if you're interested in checking out her light challenge, there is a link down below. Um, it's only 37 bucks, and you've got until Sunday night to enroll. Christina, do you want to talk about, while we're waiting for those questions to yeah. come in, talk about, you know... I, I think the main question has been people saying like, oh, I'm afraid I won't have time next week to do it. Okay. Yeah. First off, Tina, thank you. Tina's from Premier. She's actually one of my star people. She's done everything right from the beginning. She joins me for <laughs> live one-on-one -on -one support and she has seen amazing, amazing results. So proud of her. Um, light. So for those of you that are concerned about, you know, the amount of time that you're going to spend doing this. So light, the light framework was a design to build upon itself each day. So we're really doing one simple digestible task each day. And the pre-recorded lessons are, um, now I actually have an itch and I do look like I'm picking my nose, <laughs> but the pre-recorded lessons are under 30 minutes each. You get those the night before. So anybody who's in another time zone, you'll have plenty of time to go through the lesson, submit your action steps. And then the, the big time consuming part, action steps aren't super time consuming, maybe 20 to 30 minutes each. So we're looking at about an hour a day that you may need to actually invest and put into this. Now, if you want to get even more out of the program, I do a live Q&A every single day. And I stay till the end, till all post submissions, questions have been answered, have been critiqued. And typically they do run between three and four hours long. So this is where it can get time consuming. I have some makers who absolutely love watching my lives because they learn so much. So during the live, you will see, you know, 20, 30, 40 people getting their photos critiqued. And the, the cool thing is everybody has individual problems. Everybody has individual struggles. And some of these struggles you would not even recognize or you would, you know, maybe you haven't experienced them yourself. So when you get to see other people's struggles, it's really cool because you learn so much more outside of what you've experienced at this point. But because they do run long and some of you don't have a lot of time to watch and pay attention to you know three or four hours of critiques i time stamp everybody's critique so if you are on time restriction you can 100 just go straight to that time where you're getting critiqued and and you'll be good to go that's so, awesome <laughs> a couple hours maybe a couple hours for the week it won't be too bad and you get lifetime access to everything so yeah you can download the videos so you get to keep those um and like she said, if you can't make it to the the critiques, you can zip right through and find your specific critique. Though I do recommend, it's just like when you guys ask about, you know, our critique sessions on our channel. Yeah, everybody wants their critique. Everybody wants to watch their, you know, special critique. But you, and I'm sure that everybody in the chat can agree that you learn so much more by watching other people's critiques as well, just because you might not be aware that this problem exists, but then you just kind of naturally learn to avoid it in the future. So that's absolutely awesome. If you guys have questions about light, you're free to ask those as well. Um, but Christina, I think we've got enough questions in the chat to start rolling. Are, are you good? I'm ready. I was, I was trying to keep up with the comments, but I keep getting ads that pop up, so it's distracting me. I turned it off. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry for everybody who's dealing with ads. Mark and I have got the ads turned down to the lowest like possible amount, and for some reason, they still pop up. It's, it's yeah. Um, so let's see. Max had asked, Christina, were you ever a member of National Association of uh photoshop professionals oh no that's a different that's the different one a member of napp when it was called that i wonder if we were ever at the same event no 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 i don't know what that is <laughs> so christina nicole is actually my um middle name nicole is my middle name um kind of a funny backstory there, but I'm actually, uh, I went through high school and actually went to college to be an opera singer. And I always told myself, I'm like, if I ever become like famous, like Christina Nicole will be my stage name, right? <laughs> and so when I decided to open this business, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to use my stage name. <laughs> That's special. That's, I, you know what? I always said that if my name was 
because my, my maiden name's Truman. And I'm like, man, if my name was Brittany Truman, like, I don't think that it, uh, people would ever remember me. <laughs> no one would know what my YouTube channel is. You got to pick the best name. Right. So, and Mark, but most people don't know, every once in a while, I'll slip and call Mark Anthony because his name is Mark Anthony. And nobody, none of the family calls him Mark either. We all call him Anthony. <laughs> I've never heard you slip and say that. And I did not know that. Yeah, I only call him Anthony. And Mark is the only, I call him that on, on screen. Um, let's see, Fatty Pancake asked, uh, is a photo light box the same Calvin as natural light? And if not, how can we adjust it to make it near, per or make near perfect photos with little retouches? Okay, so um, pure white is gonna be about 5,500 Kelvin. That's the closest you're going to get to that. So if you buy any type of artificial lights, 100%, you want to be right about that 5,500 Kelvin mark. Um, I typically recommend soft boxes for artificial lights, at least about 24 inches for most products, unless your product is significantly bigger than that. Um, but the, the set that I recommend recently transitioned, and now they only offer, I think it's a 5,600 Kelvin, not a huge difference, but you want to get as close to the 5,500 as you can. Now, as far as natural light, that's going to constantly be changing. Um, you know, when you have that warmer sun in the morning and in the evenings, that's going to be a much, much um, lower Kelvin rating, whereas the higher Kelvin rating is going to be more that blue, like if it's storming out. So with natural light, you're always going to get a variety of um, color temperatures. Midday is going to be closest to that pure white when the sun is highest in the sky. But one thing that you can do when it comes to natural light to kind of avoid having to make too many white balance or color temperature adjustments in editing is to use a um, diffuser that's pure white. So the five and one that you can buy on Amazon, when the sun filters through that pure white, it definitely helps bring that color temperature back to where, where you need it. Do you have uh, that five and one on hand? To <laughs> of course she does. The scary one that pops up. No, I, I made. It, I've got a smaller one today. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> this so is a five and one. You're gonna have five options within this, and you can only use one at a time though. So black is gonna be your absorber. So if you need to flag light or you want to, um, this is used a lot when you have darker backdrops. If you've ever noticed on a dark backdrop, you get kind of like this white haze over it if you're using white reflection. So this is kind of where you would use that. Silver, we don't really use in product photography unless you need to reflect kind of that silver look back onto like silver jewelry or something because this can be a little cooler in temperature. But if we unzip this baby, the inside, we're going to have gold. Gold is going to reflect a warmer color temperature. So we don't typically use this for product photography. And for those of you that don't know, the reason we want to be closest to that pure white, we don't want those cooler, warmer temperatures is because we want your product color to be as true to real life as possible. And anytime we have kind of a different color temperature or reflecting warm or cool back onto the setup, this can alter the true color of your product. So my recommendation is white reflection. And the cheapest option for that is going to be white foam boards. And white reflection is going to give you a softer reflection back. But my favorite part and my go-to use is the diffuser. So this is the center portion. It's transparent material. This is pure white. So when those, you know, natural light comes through this, if it's really warm or cool, it's going to transition it closer to that pure white. Diffusers are used to reduce intensity while also increasing the perceived size of the light, which reduces shadows. Yeah, I, I see that mistake all the time from you guys during critique week, um, where your product photos, I'll talk about sharp shadows, sharp shadows, <laughs> where you're like taking those photos, I can tell you found a nice picnic table in your yard. And you've taken a photo where the product in the natural sunshine probably looks really pretty. It probably looks great when you're looking at it with your eyes. But then when you actually pull that photograph onto your computer, the dark spots look darker. The light spots are just so bright and blown out that it, it makes a very harsh and unpleasant photo. Whereas 
you know, what Christina is showing you is how to take that light and just kind of spread it out so that it's not penetrating straight through uh, to your product. And and Christina, you've um, your YouTube channel is linked down below as well. You guys should all go subscribe to her and check out some of her videos because she... I love how you do your your actual tutorials where you've got part of the screen um, mm. shows what your camera is seeing, and then the other part of the screen is actually her and the you know her photo props and her uh, replica surfaces all set set up. Mm. It, it's it's a really fun way to follow along with her and kind of learn. So if you know if you haven't subscribed yet, definitely uh, go in and check that out. But um. Fern if had asked. Are, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. If you guys are experiencing those, the hard shadows and you're having a hard time getting rid of them, or just that really harsh light where you have that high contrast from light to dark, that a uh, day two, that's what we're going to tackle in light is reducing that intensity and softening those shadows so we can really, really focus on your product. Yeah. So Fern had asked, I take product pics of stickers. How do I avoid the overhead shadow when I lean in and take the picture? So I think she's seeing her own, I'm assuming she, sorry, uh, <laughs> your own photo. Okay, so if you are getting a shadow of yourself, then you do not have a proper light setup. So two components here, more than likely, and I'm just making assumptions based on how you're talking about the shadow. But if you are experiencing a shadow as you lean over, then that means your light is above you, okay? Which means you're probably using overhead lighting in your house or just household lighting in general. I will tell you guys right now, that is probably the worst scenario you can create for yourself is using your in-home lighting. So we're talking about whole mess of issues as far as color temperatures. We're talking about a whole mess of issues as far as shadows, uneven light, all of that. So your in-home lighting, whether it's recessed lighting or a ceiling fan or whatever, they're, they're small, small, and they're up high. So small light sources that are further away from your product are going to create those hard to find shadows. Okay. So getting a dedicated setup, which I recommend side light, on most occasions for product photography, 45 degree isn't, isn't horrible either because you're, you're going to want to have just a little bit of a shadow when it comes to your product, because shadows actually bring out texture detail and they create dimension in your photos. So if you've ever noticed that you take in a product photo and it looks really flat or just kind of dull more often than not, that's going to be your light setup because you don't have a dedicated light setup to create dimension in your photo. So your products typically look two dimensional in, in an image, right? And those shadows are kind of what help make it pop, jump out and look like somebody could just pick it up and hold it, make it look more true to real life. So side light is the best way to create that depth and dimension. Yeah. I, even right now, I mean, I, I was laughing at Amy's comment because she said, no big light, no big light. Anyone with ADHD can tell you that because the ADHDers turn on the big light to punish themselves when they need to clean the house. You know, you don't get to have the small lights until... Have you ever heard that, Christina? No. Mark does that to punish himself. He turns on the big light that to motivate himself to clean because he hates the big light. Because, huh. yeah... Mm -hmm. it, ADHDers hate the big light. But even now, when Christina's talking about the side light, I don't have a light in front of me right now. The reason that our space is so well lit is we have umbrella light here, big softbox light up here, side lights here. Oop, just hit one, side lights here. And that's why our videos look so good. This applies to everything. I hear people talk about, you know, recording their videos and, you know, my videos look flat, my videos look so crappy. It's your lighting. It's your lighting that's making your videos look fat or fat, fat. <laughs> your videos are fat, like with a PH, PHAT, fat, yo. No, your videos look flat because your lighting situations aren't uh, aren't optimal. And I hear that a lot, Christina, too, is people asking, like, will this help with my, you know, my listing videos or like my, I don't know, my TikTok videos? Yes. So here's the thing, like, like Starla mentioned, light 
the setup that I use for my photos, the setup I use for any type of video of like actual products is exactly the same. The only time I transition a little bit in my lighting, and as Starla mentioned, she's got side and kind of cornered front light, which 45 degree light, especially when you got it on both sides, right? It's, it's kind of filling in the same, is when you're doing like talking heads, because what would happen is if you had side light only right now with a face, you guys would see every single wrinkle pore that I have. Oh yeah. <laughs> so with products, if you use front light, never use front light with your products. If you use front light, you are going to flatten and you are going to get rid of any texture, dimension, any of that. Now, as far as us as humans, that's not always a bad thing, right? Like we we maybe want to flatten out our faces a little bit to get rid of <laughs> the pores and texture and all of that. So that's the only time I would recommend having a different light setup is if you are potentially doing videos or yeah, basically that. Because even when you're, if you're shooting a product on a person, we would still want to look at that side light because we're going to be focusing solely on the product there, not the actual individual. Yeah. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to keep up with y'all. Mm -hmm. um, Eight o'clock Linen Co. had asked, any tips on reducing glare or reflection? Mm -hmm. uh, example, being the reflection of their phone when photographing shiny things like dishes or metals. Yeah, so reflection, we tackle that on day four of light. There's a couple different um, solutions, but the, and, and here's the thing, guys, is I don't hold back on what I teach you, so I'm going to basically teach you exactly what I teach in light. The benefit, the huge benefit of you joining me inside of light is that you get personalized support. So if you have a specific problem, you bring it to me and I give you a very specific solution. Okay. So when it comes to reflections, we use, we talk about modifying light all the time. Flagging, it's called flagging. It's blocking light. So whether it's you, whether it's the light actually hitting your product and creating like this hot spot, maybe it's something in the room around you that's hitting. A lot of times I see windows reflected back into products, all of that. We want to flag block that reflection. Sometimes if you can't tell where that reflection is coming from, I don't know if I have one of these in my little toolkit, but I get these little tiny mirrors at Hobby Lobby. They're like literally about that big. And I take it sometimes and put it where I see the reflection and the mirror will kind of reveal what is reflecting back ah. in the product. So then I can take like a little white foam board or I could take a little black foam board and I can cut them down small enough to where I'm blocking that reflection, but I'm not necessarily blocking the light that's, that's lighting my setup. Um, camera angles will be a huge one. You can adjust the actual camera angle. You can adjust the product angle to avoid reflections. And then if you're speaking specifically about like, hey, I've got, you know, I'm standing in front of my setup holding my phone and I can see myself reflected back. I can see the camera reflected back. One cool little trick that you can do there. One, I recommend a tripod. So put your camera on a tripod and then get like a white foam board or depending on. So when we talk about reflection, like trying to block and reflect something more seamless onto your product, you want to think about your product color. So if you have a darker object, you won't necessarily want to use white to block that reflection because that white's then going to reflect back in your product. It may you know, make it kind of dull, washed out. So you got to think about the color. So sometimes we'll use black, gray, or white to reflect back. But what you'll do is just create a little like hole where your camera lens would be. So you would just put that white phone board or black phone board in the front, in front of your camera and just have the hole for the lens. And that will take away you, anything that is in the surrounding area. That's so smart. Have you ever seen that, that picture? It circulated like back from the MySpace days of the guy selling the tea kettle, but he was butt naked and you could just see everything <laughs> reflected in the kettle that he was selling. Yeah. yeah don't, don't take your product photography naked. Um, but <laughs> that's the I'll lesson. Of, that now. <laughs> that's the lesson. I'll find it for you. I'll send it to you. Um, but you know, I've become hyper aware through my own 
I don't know, business analytical brain, and Mark has too, where when we get any magazine, any catalog, if we are looking at a billboard, we're constantly looking for things like that. And a lot of the times I will see people, I will see human beings reflected back in sunglass ads and, you know, different different catalogs for dishes and things. And these feel like very simple fixes that even these pr probably mm -hmm. very highly paid professionals don't even realize. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me sometimes when we see things in commercial photography, like there's a lot of times in commercial photography, or even I think it was somebody had posted in my group, it was like a Starbucks uh, menu. Like they took a screenshot or took a photo of a Starbucks menu on the wall and the shadows that they put around like the cups, because you know, like the backing was just white. So they had to do, create a drop shadow. They were so hard and defined and unrealistic looking. I was just like, am I missing something? Like, yeah, are, are we intentionally trying to make this not feel normal? Like, I don't know. It's interesting. But sometimes that does grab attention. They use those tactics. They make things look off or weird or not the way they should look so that it, it grabs people's attention and they recognize it. But it's just not a tactic that I would I would personally choose to use. Yeah. If you look in their comments section, too, it's all people like you who know how to do product photography who are they're like, what the hell is this? What, what have you done? It's funny. Um, no better. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. I'm torn with it's uh, with if it's better to have a simple hero photo or an aesthetic. I don't care for the ex or the aesthetic ones. I think it detracts from the product, but that seems to be what Etsy likes. Okay, so Etsy specific, talking Etsy listing thumb or the first thumbnail image. Mm -hmm. um, my best recommendation for any of you is to do your own testing. Um, this really is going to come down to your type of product, your target audience, your own branding. It's really going to be a little more specialized. So when you think about, I think it's Russell Brunson. Have you ever read one of his books where he talks about the searcher versus the scroller and like where people are in the buying process? Mm -hmm. That's something that's very psychology based where people are at in the buying process. So typically when we are on social and we are just, you know, rummaging through our feed, right? People may not even know your product exists. They may not know that they have a need for your product. So we have to almost go above and beyond to show them and almost insert and still this idea into their head. Now, if somebody goes to Etsy and they know that they want a candle that is a specific scent, they're going to go and they're going to search specifically with those keywords. So when they pop up and search, it's not like you have to inspire any kind of use or get them to think that, oh, this is the scent I want, right? They already know what they want. They're just trying to pick the best one. So at that point in the buying process, they just want more information. They want to find the right one that's for them. Now, your own data is going to be huge here. How are your listings getting found in Etsy? Are you looking at your statistics on what keywords are bringing you views and sales? Because that actually discloses a lot in regards to who is searching for your product and how they're searching for your product. So if one of your major keywords of getting found is some kind of like gift option, well, you know, those people are coming to Etsy. They're looking for best gift for mother or something like that. That's more generic. So in, in that point in the buying process, they aren't exactly sure what they want. They just want something for, you know, their mother. And that means that you may have to kind of instill the idea into their mind that your product, what you have to offer is going to be the perfect gift for their mom. So getting to a point here, I promise. With that <laughs> said, if depending on how people are searching for your products, how they're finding your listings, you want to consider that. If it's very specific, then you may not need to create a lifestyle photo that's going to give them all the gooey feeling emotions. You may just need to make your product really stand out and pop and search, okay? Because you want to have all those types of photos either way. Because once they click into your listing, you're going to want each photo to communicate something very, very specific. So when it comes to the thumbnail, my best my best advice to you is to actually test it. There's not a lot of 
I don't see a lot of consistencies when it comes to looking at big brands or even on Etsy. We see such a variety. I think that quality is going to be the most important factor is making sure you have a quality photo, whether it's just the product, the hero image, or whether it's some kind of styled photo. But one quick tip, if you are going to add props into your photos, when it comes to that listing thumbnail, my suggestion is there's two suggestions. If you're shooting straight on where you actually have depth in your photo, make sure you blur those background elements to really make your product pop and make sure your product is taking up majority of the frame. So maybe those props are just peeking into the frame so that there isn't any confusion about what is actually for sale on that listing. And then if you're doing flat lays, you really can't create depth. You really can't blur that background. So again, Make sure your product fills most of the frame and then just let those little props peek in and, and give a little 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 sensory help there. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of where I struggled um, before, you know, really evaluating my photos. And I obviously I also went through the product photography essentials workshop, which talked a little bit more about, um, you know, some of these topics than than light does. And my students get product photography essentials workshop for free. Go into the bonuses vault, um, mm -hmm. HAA students. If, if you're not aware, that's in there for you. But, you know, I would you know, go and find, oh, I'll put little leaves and little rocks and little items. And, and that works now because I'm an officially licensed bookish shop. So I kind of go based on props that are relevant to the stories. Like I'll have a dagger, I'll have, you know, some nature elements that fit with the environment of the book. Mm -hmm. But back when I was, you know, making jewelry, I was putting all kinds of weird crap around my jewelry that I was putting candy corn and things. And I'm like, this is not, these are not items that go with mm -hmm. what I'm actually and, and that's huge because I think when you get very clear on who your ideal customer is and very clear on just what, because, you know, you talk about all the time. I love when you talk brain candy and it's like you talked yesterday when we were on the E-Rank Live about how people won't even like say, oh, that's a bad photo or that's not relevant to me. They just will scroll past because when you are being given and thrown so many things all day long, like thousands and thousands and thousands of ads or photos or, you know, just communication, your brain is not going to pay attention to what isn't relevant to you, things you don't recognize. So you have to get, when you start adding those props in, you want there to be a very specific theme. You want it to be relatable to the actual product you're selling to your branding and to that customer. The customer is going to be the biggest component though, is you you really want to make sure you're including props and elements that is just going to bring everything together and really grab, grab attention. They contribute to the emotion. You know, I always, in HAA, I talk about um, the road trip theory, where if you are on a long road trip, from the point that you get into your car until you reach your destination, it's very unlikely that you're going to remember a whole lot of the details in between. You're going to remember, you know, landmarks and things like that. But for the most part, we kind of zone out and that's how we live our life. However, if you're passing, you know, we'll say 100 billboards on a long road trip, uh, if you live in the U.S., sorry for those of you who live internationally and you don't have the uh, glory of driving for hours and hours and hours. Um, but in the U.S., you know, I, I remember our trip from California to Ohio. We had to have passed thousands of road signs. And you don't remember all those road signs. You don't remember all those advertisements. You don't remember all those billboards. However, if on that road trip, your favorite band or your favorite singer is on one of those billboards, your brain snags on that and stops and looks at that because that piece of information is relevant to you. It's not that your brain is not looking at all of these things. It's just not cataloging them in a meaningful way. So your brain sees everything, but it only passes teeny tiny bits of relevant information into our conscious awareness. Because if it were to give us everything at all times that we're seeing, 
and and passing that through to our conscious awareness, our brain wouldn't be able to handle that much. Mm-hmm. Um, and you guys can learn more about this in, in some of the books that I recommend. If you go to handmadealphaacademy.com, I've actually got my reading list, I believe, on, on the homepage right now. Um, there's like a Trello board with all of my favorite books. But books like Predictably Irrational um, kind of outline this by, uh, by Dan Ariely. So definitely lean into that side of psychology um even as you're staging your your product photos and thinking like christina said what's actually relevant to this item and and the overall mood and feelings that i'm trying to create yeah and and start doing that yourself as you scroll through social like when something grabs your attention evaluate it think about okay why did this matter to me and you'll see you know, reoccurrences yourself. Do you, like, I remember when we were first taking our, our first, first program together, mm-hmm. Starla, branding was a big one for me. Like branding wasn't relevant before I started my product-based business, right? Probably had never really understood the concept, never really dove deep into it. But I remember after I really learned about it and understood like the psychology behind it and all that, did you not recognize every single brand's branding? Oh, like- st- I still do. I still, <laughs> Mark and I, we, we go to this diner and you can pay for ad space and they'll print you on the table. It's, you know, oh, just no, traditional no. American diner with all the little ads on the table printed. And we'll sit there and eat and be like, well, that's a crappy advertisement. Well, that's awful font. Well, those colors are terrible. It's... Yeah, I just remember like being like, oh my gosh, I get it now. Like they really hit the nail on that one. That's exactly for this person. I remember to be like, "Mm, I don't know. That's not that's not the best branding. They missed the mark there. (laughs) You guys should start practicing this, especially if you I mean, when you're watching TV, we don't have TV, so we we have TVs, but we don't watch TV. We watch YouTube and, and Netflix and stuff. But analyze ads, analyze print ads, analyze ads online. Look at how they differ. Print ads in a magazine don't convert to online. And a lot of people, a lot of you guys, I see you doing that where you try to make a beautiful magazine style advertisement and you're posting it on Instagram and it's not hitting the mark. And it's because that type of advertising doesn't transfer online. So spend some time um, evaluating the ads of others. And I'm I'm telling you, it really does help. Um, Mm -hmm. Emma had asked, do you have any courses that teach you how to style large sets like baby gift sets? Is that the other point? Okay. Um, So inside the maker's method, and this is going to sound very blanketed but so the course itself is very much like the principles and what's going to apply to most people but in any of my 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 courses the maker's method or even a light i provide personalized solutions so my maker's method course comes with 10 60 minute one-on-one calls so any issue that you have or any specific problem you have you bring it to live support and we work through it um because of that I am creating new content for the course all the time as the need approaches. So anything I teach is going to be adaptable to small products, big products, all of that. But if you have a specific need, you have a specific struggle, you just bring it to me and we work through it together. Whether that's me shooting something similar and creating some videos for you or, you know, attempting to do it on your own. I'm there to support you 100% all the way because when it comes to photography, you all are going to experience such different scenarios and issues and all of that. So it's really hard to create like this every like one size fits all program for product photography, just because there are so many, you know, different scenarios when it comes to the camera you're using the edit. I teach over, I think, eight different editing softwares inside my maker's method program because everybody is using something different. So it's really a fun course just because you get to create your own personalized workflow with me. When does that, when does that one? Open? That opens for enrollment next Friday, the 19th, I believe is the date. Okay. So guys, if, so if, that's a, if you're interested in that, mark your calendars and Christina, when that opens, can you like post in my Facebook group or I can post in my Facebook group and let them know? Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Lily asked, this is a great question. Um, are there any studies or stats out there other than anecdotal evidence? Oh, I'm so happy that she said that. <laughs> that you, I'm, 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 I'm influencing your brains. <laughs> uh, that show how great photos improve sales or other metrics like clicks, conversion rates, etc. cetera. Um, offhand, I don't know of any specifics, like the names of studies, but what I would recommend doing is um, Google photography psychology and it's very likely that you will be able to find um exact case studies from people who have paneled um i, I believe that the the area that you want to aim for for a significant amount of like data within a panel is at least 300 panelists so if mm -hmm. you can find some type of data supported by at least 300 panelists um that's going to basically be what we would consider scientifically conclusive. Yeah. Um, so that, that's a hard one just because, I mean, of course, I mean, what would you more so consider? You said over 300 would probably be enough right. to be like evidential. That's in, in neuromarketing. That's About what would be considered scientifically conclusive. I mean, I don't have that many students yet that are experiencing those kind of results, but basically how I do it inside of the maker's method is I encourage you guys to start with your best sellers. So when we jump on live support, we start with that best selling product, because if it's already selling, you're already doing something right as far as your SEO, optimizing the listing as a whole, right? So that gives you, I don't think I've ever had and I am saying this with 99% certainty that I have had a student come to me with a best-selling product. We have revamped their entire 10 photos and potentially added a listing video. And we haven't, uh, we've seen it go the opposite way. I have, I'm pretty confident. I've never had somebody have that happen. Now, again, that's just one person, one listing. But when you see those results yourself, mm -hmm it empowers you to continue moving forward. And that's why we start with that bestseller because that allows you to at least kind of break down. I mean, it's hard to test things because there's so many things that can influence the results. But when you have a great bestseller and you change that first thumbnail image, you swap out your other nine images to really communicate the value of your product and the features and the benefits and all of that, I have... I mean, I've, I do have a few videos on my channel where I think one of my, one of my, you know, prize students, she had like a 690 something increase once she shifted and started adding lifestyle photos into her listings. Like it was insane, but I mean, you got to do your own testing. Um, I'll, I'll take some time and, and research it after my launch and see if I can find anything, but it's kind of one of those things that. I mean, wouldn't you say just on a psychology side in general, like it's just, it's a no brainer, like better quality oh. is transition to higher quality. All, Absolutely. All um, and I dare say, you know, if you guys want to hear of another student who it, it's, it's two years old now, but we interviewed Ani, who was one of your makers method. I mean, she was one of your first makers method oh students on and Ani, she's in my program as well from magpie mischief. She talks about in my interview with her, how her product photos, um, helped her to land a bunch of Etsy mm -hmm. editorial picks. So those are the ones where an actual Etsy staff member hand selects you because they like your products. It's already really hard to get an editorial pick and be featured by Etsy. Ani has been featured multiple times since improving her product photos um, in, in working with Christina. So, you know, that, that's the I other benefit to it. Yeah. Is like, I have so many students. Tina's another one. She just got featured in a magazine um, for her little Santa. Stunning, just stunning photos. And Ani, yeah. And, and granted, Maybe. those are anecdotal. Um, however, Look at the anecdotal evidence, but then, like I said, Google, you know, psychology of product photography. I am sure that there are probably multiple studies that have been done on it. It's just, it's actually not something that I, I'm currently doing a huge, um, like, research session on the triggers utilized within neuromarketing. Um, and product photography isn't something that has 
come up yet, but now I'm kind of thinking, ooh, maybe that's something that I'll start also taking a peek into. Well, and you, te you teach adapting all the time too. So it's like a lot of times when we read these books, because I, I have the same passion that Starla does when it comes to the science behind things. When you read these books, you have to kind of adapt the, the concepts a little bit too. Exactly. And, you know, visual marketing and sales which is where my passion really lies. So video, graphics, photos, all, all the above. There's a lot of just evidence and, and statistics out there in general on combining text with, you know, photos and all the things. So you have to kind of adapt it. But now I'm curious. I want to go out and see if there's any. I'm going to, I'm going to do some research online in a few weeks. <laughs> Maybe I'll post in your group. <laughs> We've been inspired. Um, I did mm -hmm. notice that someone had asked about Ani's shop. It's, uh, it's Ani, not Annie. And it's Magpie Mischief. And you should be able to Google it or just go back on my channel um, and search. Um you search through our student interviews. There's actually a playlist. And it's specifically about her product photos. Um, I mean, hey, Mr. Moore could probably find it you know, when this part of the video plays through his headphones, since he's got a 30 second delay. She, she has an Etsy shop, but her actual dot com is magpie mischief shop dot com. If anybody wants to check that out, but she, yeah, she's great too. She does. I mean, she's followed your HA program to a T. Mm -hmm. Ani. Uh, her, uh, like she does collections. Um, and yeah, her, she, everything she creates and she is so niche specific and she knows her ideal a customer so specifically that everything could be everything she takes could be in a magazine i just love it carla said i wish there could be closed uh caption we're live you can't close caption alive it will it will generate though after i think it takes like 24 hours but we can't we i don't have anybody who knows how to type that fast <laughs> Um, let's see. Several people have asked if the live sessions within the light challenge are pre-recorded, but I think we've kind of gone over that. They they are pre-recorded, so you can go back and they're time stamped so that you can find your exact um your exact spot where your specific critique is. Um Tracy had asked, what soft box should we get? So soft boxes are different from a light box. I just want to point that out because I think sometimes people get those confused. Like a light box is going to be kind of like the square that you actually place your product into. And to be fully transparent, I do not recommend any on the market. I have actually tested multiple. They typically come with really small LED lights, which create shadow issues, inconsistencies with, um, you know, the overall light, because typically the light's only on one side and not another. There's just a whole slew of messes that can typically occur with store bought light boxes. Um, as far as a soft box goes, that is going to be an actual light that's going to have kind of this literally what I have up here. <laughs> I'm like, if I can just turn my camera. Um, it basically has almost like a cone looking shape to it. And then the front is a diffusion layer. So it's taking that small light source, which is, which is the light bulb inside. And then it's making the appearance of the light larger with this, you know, diffusion layer on the front. I have a, um, a set that I recommend. It's a, the newer brand. They're right around a hundred dollars. It comes with a set of two. So you can easily put them left and right of your setup to get a, you know, perfectly even light setup. If you want to emulate the sunlight a little bit more, you could do just one with reflection or you could do one and then take the other one and make it a little further back. So the light's not as intense on that side to try to emulate natural light. Um, and then inside the maker's method, I do have a DIY actual light box option that I personally designed back in 2019 that my students get excellent results from as well. Awesome. Um, Mistress 30 had said, uh, this is included in your alpha training, right? Not the light program. The light program is separate. It's only 37 bucks. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, Christine has got to eat, right? What students get is the product photography essentials workshop. So Christina, you have three programs total. Mm -hmm. Light is the most affordable. It's 37 bucks. It's only five days long. Um, and I think that it's like a huge bang for your buck. If you're on a budget 
Or if you just want to like have those little like incremental growths, I want to learn a little here. You know, I'm busy. I want to learn a little there. Oh, hey, Tootsie. And, um, and light is going to give you the biggest results when it comes to kind of transitioning because light's going to be the most important. I'm not yeah. saying light the program, but light in general. Learning, getting a proper light setup is going to create big moves for you as far as your overall image quality. Yeah. And then after that, later this month, um, she'll be opening her big, like her biggest program, which is the maker's method, which, you know, that's not open right now, but we'll have more information on that later. That opens what day? Next Friday, the 19th. Next Friday, the 19th. But then mm -hmm. my students get her product photography essentials workshop, which I like to think of that as like laying the foundation. That's mm -hmm. how I felt that that program was. It's very much like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Tell me where to start, Christina. And yeah. that's kind yeah. of always bringing awareness to what you should be recognizing, considering um, what you should be doing. The big, the big difference is if you want support. So if you have a very specific issue when it comes to your light setup, light is 100% for you because I offer support in that program. The Product Photography Essentials Workshop that is um, going to be more uh, kind of a do do it yourself, go at your own pace kind of concept, because I do not offer, I do not have group support for that program. The um, barrier to entry is a lot less because it's a smaller, you know, smaller price point as far as learning the entire recipe for getting high quality photos, but you aren't going to have direct support from me to get specific issues. That's where the maker's method comes in. Um, that's where you can get more one-on-one -on -one kind of attention. Now, and I will note that you're very responsive to my students, though, when they have questions mm -hmm. in the student campus. Yes, and you can actually post questions within the course. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have any, yeah, if any, I answer those questions, it's just that me taking the time to replicate your setup or me taking the time, <laughs> sometimes I have students actually send me their product if we're really struggling with something. That's, I don't do that kind of stuff with the product photography essentials, but um, it's really in. I had a thought and then I forgot about it. Went right on my brain. Float away. <laughs> I'm sure it'll come back. Probably. Uh, Miranda, Miranda has brilliant photos. Um, I talk about Miranda's photos all the time. She is um in the bookish niche. She makes bookmarks. Mm -hmm. Um, and her uh, account is Merkwood Scribes. I think that she does a fantastic job just creating the mood when it comes to like what the bookstagram community expects. Um, she asked, do you think the 24 inch five in one will work since she's mostly photographing bookmarks and books, you know, being very small? And I dare say that that would probably be fine for such a small space that she works within. She her She's got a very tiny little flat lay space. Yeah. So if you, the biggest thing is you want to take that diffuser and you want to bring it right up to your setup. So if you're doing a lot of flat lays and um, you know what a good thing might be to do if you, if you really want to test it before you actually purchase something is get a piece of cardboard or a piece of poster board, something you have lying around your house and actually cut that circumference and then take that circumference and put it next to your setup uh, next to a window. And if that shadow completely covers your setup, then you're good to go. That's so hard. opposite is going to be when you actually get that diffuser, you're going to want to make sure you diffuse, you know, the light on your entire setup. So that would be my best suggestion. If you just have something laying around the house, just make sure it covers. I use, I'm trying to think, I do have a 22 inch. Um, she's, is she an alpha? She's in the handmade alpha group. Yep, she's a, she's in the student campus. Uh, I'll, I'm I'm gonna test I'm gonna test it for you, and I'm gonna show you um, after. So I'll give you some measurements measurements after after cool. this live. I'll go up and take a photo for you and post it to the group. Awesome. Uh, Julie asked, "Are a diffuser and reflector always needed, or are there ways to take photos without these? Is that what l the light course covers? I mean, this might be a good time to talk about alternatives to the diffusers for us cheapos." Yeah. <laughs> so um, here's the thing. Ideally, and honestly, it's really it's really the easiest to learn. Ideally, you're going to want soft, soft, even light. 
that's going to increase your quality. And I say that because when you're not a photographer, light can become very complicated and technical. So when I say soft, even light is the easiest to achieve, it creates the most steps, but it's, it's the easiest to achieve. And it gives you the best results in, in, in like a blanket statement there. So with soft, even light, if you're using the sunlight, the sunlight is a huge light source, but it's so far away. It really becomes teeny tiny in comparison to your setup and your product. And that's why you get these, these hard to find shadows. That's where diffusion comes in. Diffusion is going to scatter that light and increase the perceived size of it. And when it's right up against your setup, it's going to soften those shadows. Now, if you're using one light source like the sun or you have one soft box, you're going to see this fall off of light on opposite. And so we really want to use that reflection to kind of fill in that fall off of light. So if the goal is to have soft shadows with even light throughout, which is going to make editing a lot easier. It's going to make your photos just instantly look higher quality. Yes, you will always need that diffusion and that reflection, even on a cloudy day. So maybe this is where you're kind of coming from. On a cloudy day, you will notice that you don't get like that harsh contrast between lights and darks, but you still get pretty hard to find shadows. The reason is, is those clouds, they're acting like a layer of diffusion. But again, they are so far away that they're not actually increasing the perceived size of the sun because they're far away with the sun. So we still technically will add a layer of diffusion next to our setup, even on a really cloudy day, if the goal is to reduce the shadows. Now, hard to find shadows are not necessarily a bad thing when done correctly, which I find... Most makers, they aren't intentionally creating these shadows for like hero images, right? They are just happening and they're not sure how to get rid of them. So they come with those hard to find shadows. They come with this fall off of light and then everything just kind of looks looks messy. Yeah, I've we've got one student. Um, uh, oh, goodness, what's her name? Uh, her shop name is Night Moves. Oh, goodness. One of you guys knows what what who I'm talking about. Um, she takes these amazing photos of like this polymer clay, 80 super duper chunky earrings. And she uses the crazy colored backgrounds and the monochromes like we talked about yesterday. Mm -hmm. But she styles her shadows in a way that it it's very intentional. And she is one of the only people I've ever seen pull it off because it, you can tell that she's done a lot of research into how mm -hmm. to use shadows to her advantage. For the majority of people that I see who have those harsh shadows, it's a problem that I don't even think that they're aware of. Exactly. And a lot of times they're better, like hard to find shadows are great, um, you know, for social, for marketing images. But when you have a listing and you want to show the product in full, it's really challenging to get all the product detail with hard to find shadows because a lot of times there is that fall off of light so part of the product will also be kind of in this like shadowy darker area and then you lose product detail so we really want to make sure that with our listing photos specifically that we are able to show the product in full and without you know just that distraction so being intentional is, is super super important and like i said i find that a lot of makers have shadows that are not intentional, which ends up creating kind of a slew of, of problems with the light in general. Yeah. And and you also lack control there to be able to mm -hmm. replicate that exact strategy, again, if the shadows weren't intentional. And that's what light teaches you. It teaches you how to control every possible scenario. So we go through, like I said, day by day, we create, we tackle a new challenge that you might be facing and you learn how to control those issues so when they pop up, you've got the cure. Uh, Fertanical Wares had asked, are replica surfaces and props talked about in light? That's more of a maker's method thing, isn't it? Yeah. So I want to set real expectations here. During the challenge, we, um, we are talking about light. We are covering light. Now, it's just my style that I will give tips here and there. Um, 
as I'm doing critiques, I will recommend different backdrops. I will recommend um, potential props that may be relevant to your product in my critiques, but there won't be necessarily any lessons on that. I do have one lesson in the welcome module. I give you 10 tips for getting kind of the most out of the challenge. And with those 10 tips, I do go over some camera settings and I go over some actual setup um, concepts as far as whether you're shooting flat lay 45 degree or straight on. So I'm always kind of push, putting it in there, but I like to think of that as a um, extra. That's definitely not what the challenge is intended for, but I'll sprinkle it in here and there. And you also sprinkle it in in your YouTube videos as well. Yeah. So you pick things up, even when you're not talking. Hello. Oh, oh. <laughs> That's how you know it's live. Um, it, oh, what are you doing? Messing around with stuff. Oh, no. Where'd she go? She's still, is she still here. here? Wait, Wait, we still so I just, so I made there she is. disappeared and rejoined. You're good. Okay. You're, you're um, in. Can you hear us? Yep. You got me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I was going to say real quick too, like I personally use Replica Surfaces. They are an amazing company, but y'all, they're high price point. Okay. So this is like, you're, you've hit a certain point. You're looking to create more realistic type setups, that kind of stuff. You can 100% make your own backdrops. I have videos on my channel that show you how to make your own backdrops all of that. And one thing I wanted to mention, because I think you talk about this all the time too, Starla, and that's one of the things that I just absolutely love about you and Mark. I do not hold back in my teaching. So I yeah. teach a lot of my stuff on YouTube. Now on YouTube, you're going to have to piecemeal it together, all of that. But really the benefit of my courses is the support that you get. So just keep that in mind. If you're on a tight budget and you're not ready to invest in um, you know, either light or the, uh, the maker's method, I have a ton of free content, ton of free content that you can get started with on my YouTube channel. Absolutely. And, and start with free. You know, if that's what I always say when it comes to like courses and things, because you guys know, I don't really recommend any other courses other than Christina's because I don't, I have trust issues. We all know that there's some mm -hmm. crappy coaches out there. Um, but you know, if you're one of those people who, especially if you can't like, you know, if the $37 even feels like a huge expense, don't run and, you know, borrow 37 bucks from somebody. Like, get to know Christina and spend some time with that free content because you are going to learn a lot. And then maybe next time it opens, um, you know, it's something that, that you can consider. But, you know, don't... Yeah, I think even Christina the video I released today and the past two weeks have all been about light. They've yeah. all, I've been showing you guys how to reduce shadows. I talk about the difference between hard and soft light. Like the information is there. But if you want the shortcut, you want to come directly to me and say, hey, this is the problem I have. And you want a specific solution for yourself. By all means that you're going to get some great, great um, advice and light's going to be amazing for you. <laughs> Right, more personalized. Yeah, there you go. I couldn't think of the word. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a long week. Results, yes. Um, hey, Rob, thank you so much. I forgot to mention, guys, that our charity uh, this month mm -hmm. is Care, and they help uh, gently used cats to find homes. <laughs> They take cats from uh, kill shelters mm -hmm. and basically cats that are on, you know, death row and save them and ensure that they find homes. So please consider donating. We will be running this charity. I don't know. We might do this one for two months just because we love kitty cats. But um, Barbara had asked, and I know that we're probably down to the last 20 minutes, so I'll try to power through as many as we can if you're good to speed round. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> cool. Barbara asked, I make and sell bags and really struggle to get accurate fabric colors. I use an I, uh, iPhone 13 Pro Max. The colors change depending on how far away I stand. Blacks, grays, and browns are the hardest. Okay. So initially a proper light setup is going to um, be your best outcome for getting accurate colors. But just keep in mind a smartphone, really any digital camera, especially entry level type DSLRs, you are going to have limitations when it comes to color accuracy just because they don't record like the full, full spectrum um, of colors. I'm not going to get technical with that, but there's just a limitation when it comes to the red, green, and blue values that are available um, when it comes to processing those images. So proper light setup is the, the first thing I recommend. And then you're going to have to probably, if you're having extreme issues when you go to shoot your smart with your smartphone camera, 
you may have to learn some selective type editing stuff in a more advanced, you know, not free. Does iPicky do selective type editing, Starla? Yeah, you can. I, I, a little bit, but. Yeah, I was just in there yesterday because I was doing um, some product or uh, it was photos for Michelle, her mom's an author, and mm -hmm. they're about to do a combo with a book and a plush toy. And I have pictures of Mark's niece holding the toy, but um, because it was just not a great day for product photos, the colors were super washed out. So I went in and selectively used a manual brush. You can control the hardness um, okay. of those brushes, the fade of those brushes, which is what I really like because you get those nice, um, you can choose. Whereas with Canva, you can't control the hardness of a brush and I hate that. Um, and yeah, so it, it's really easy to go in with an, with iPicky and increase things like uh, saturation and contrast on those specific areas that just aren't getting the attention that they need. Um, Amanda asked, is it better to zoom in to the product or physically move closer? Ooh, that's a great question. Excellent question. So 100% you want to be, and this is actually a huge mistake I see makers... Um, do all the time, especially with smartphone photography, you want to frame your product for the most part, how you would end up cropping it. So you want it to fill the frame a good bit because what happens here is smartphones are great for online, but they do have limitations as far as the number of pixels. So when you go to resize your photos, you'll notice like from an, from an iPhone, you're going to get that uh, 432 by 324, I believe it is for the pixel dimensions. And then Etsy is going to want you between like two and 3000. So you don't have a lot of wiggle room. So if you have to go and crop out half of the image just to make your product really show in the frame, you're losing half of those pixels. So we got to be mindful there because then we could move into some quality issues. So that's one of the first things I talk about when it comes to, you know, somebody coming to me and saying, I'm not getting great quality photos from my um, smartphone camera. They look blurry. Framing is going to be a huge component here. Um, so smartphone cameras, they are said to have that optical zoom, which is supposed to not have a decrease in quality. I will tell you 100%, I never use zoom on my smartphone. I see a decrease in quality immediately when I do. So my recommendation to you is to move in as close as you can. Now, typically I am cropping out about one fourth of my photo from a smartphone when I go to actually crop it for, you know, I say Etsy, but I'm not on Etsy anymore, but you know what I'm saying? When I go to actually crop it as an example for an Etsy photo, I'm cropping out about one fourth. The other recommendation real quick, if I can give one stellar tip is you guys naturally pick up your phones. We use them. We, we, we look at them vertically all day long. Pick up your phone, turn it sideways to shoot, okay? Because most platforms are going to require either that rectangle shape or that square. And a lot of times when you shoot vertically and you go to crop for a platform, your product ends up getting cut out because you've filled the frame vertically and now you're having to chop off the top and the bottom, right? So that is just a quick tip I have there to kind of help you prevent yourself from reshooting is just to make sure you are thinking about how you're going to use those products. And for myself, I actually shoot vertical and horizontal every single time just because social platforms, that's where the challenge comes in. Social platforms are going to you know, perform better with those verticals, but most selling platforms are either going to be square or rectangle. Yeah. And uh, Fatty Pancake, it said, doesn't standing too close also create lens distortion? I don't think that she means that you should be like, you know, like this with your product photos. When she's shooting, and I, I kind of observe through your YouTube videos, I mean, you've got a decent amount of distance, but you're not standing way the heck back here zooming in. You're also not like right up here on basically on top of the product no so with a smartphone i recommend a tripod and a bluetooth shutter release which that's just a little remote that's get you're going to capture the photo with because one limitation of smartphones is they don't have the best image stabilization of course that's something they work on to increase every year new models come out but even just holding your camera and like have you know just motion or the tap of the screen to capture the photo creates this small movement and that affects the sharpness of your images, which 
in turn affects the overall quality. So if you're using a tripod, you guys will notice in a lot of my videos, I put that tripod literally up against my setup because that's as close as I can potentially get. Um, now, for those of you that have really, really teeny, teeny, tiny products, and you're cutting out a lot of the frame, I recommend the Tripod Pocket Pro. So this is an actual tripod that it's really cool. It's like the size of a credit card. I have one of those. Do you? I love it. So you, if I can get it to work here, twist it. Fits it fits in your wallet. It fits in your wallet. You put your phone into it, essentially like this. Wait, bring it down just a little. Boob level, boob level. There you go. <laughs> and you can put this on your actual wool setup. Um, yes, the wide angle lens can create distortion. You are completely hundred percent accurate in that, but you will visibly see it. And more often than not, it's going to be more with like tall vertical type products. You're going to see it more. Um, so just, just be mindful of it, but also be mindful not to crop out too much of your photo. When you go into editing, you want to get that framing fr right from the start. All right. Here's a really um, interesting one. I sell car air fresheners and want to take a picture of the item shown hanging from the rear view mirror. Any tips for lighting setup in the car? Such a challenge. Ooh, that feels like it might be dependent on time of day more than anything. So I would go with a really bright kind of sunny day. And typically that's come that that light's going to be shooting in through the back side, right behind your product. Well, we need to get some light on the front of your product. So two things. One, if you're using a smartphone, make sure you set focus on your product because cameras, they're guessing. They don't know. So when you have this like high bright light in the background, that's going to really make your product super, super shadowed. OK, um, so set focus. Now, you may notice that it blows out the background, but the, this is actually something I'm not super impressed with with the iPhones lately is there is a setting called HDR and it's high dynamic range. And essentially what it does is it takes multiple exposures. It focuses on, you know, your background. If you have different lighting, your foreground, all that kind of stuff. And it blends them. Well, we used to have the capability of turning it off and we no longer do, I think the past three years in an iPhone. So we're losing a little bit of creative control there. But as far as lighting that that setup, get a white foam board and put it like, so you have the window light coming in, right? And you're going to put it this way. And all that window light is going to hit that white board and it's going to reflect back onto your product hanging. I also make sure your dashboard is clean. And I when I say get a microfiber cloth, even your little components, if you can see any of the dashboard components, please make sure that you get the dust off of them, food crumbs, all of that. And then the other pro tip I have is to, again, set focus, use portrait, blur out those other elements, really, really make your product pop. All right. And this kind of goes with that. I think Jessica had asked, is uh, is the iPhone the best for mobile photography? Mm -hmm. I started buying pixels from Google because the camera was the best from Android, but the newest versions have awful cameras now. We bought the very first Google Pixel. I think it was the first Google Pixel. And I love the photos. The one after that was so crappy. I'm sure they're better now. Um, it's been years, but I remember praising the Google Pixels. And now, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So we talked about this yesterday and I'll be mm -hmm. real honest with you. I don't think you can go wrong with really any of the newer, newer models, especially for what you guys are doing. Keep in mind, you, there's specific tools for specific things. So you'll hear a lot of photographers say, buy a DSLR camera, better quality. It's going to take better photos, all of that for what job. And that's the thing you have to keep in mind because a lot of photographers, they are enlarging for print and they need those high resolution cameras to in enlarge their photos. They need all those pixels. You're actually doing the opposite when you're creating photos for online. You are going to be reducing the pixels. You're going to be reducing the file size so that you can optimize them for, for the web so that they load fast. Okay. So it's always really, really important to keep in mind what the end goal is and what the best tool for that job is going to be. Smartphone is going to be great for taking photos for your online shop. And really that's, you know, any smartphone. Now we did mention that, you know, if it comes to the iPhone, 
or even an Android, you'll notice that they have different models, right? With the iPhone specifically, Pro models are going to have a better camera. That Pro version is specifically focusing more on the camera. So I highly recommend always going with a Pro option. But I think the most important thing is the interface that you're used to. Like we've talked about this. I have an Android that I keep around for to help my students inside the maker's method. And I hate it. I am like <laughs> constantly pressing the wrong button. I can't ever get where I need to get. So I think sometimes when it comes to learning something new, it creates a lot more frustration than it would just be to learn how to get the most from, you know, what you're used to. All right. Let's see. Except you don't have a back button for iPhones. So <laughs> that's what Mark switched the, to iPhone and I'm still on Android. And he's like, I like everything other than that there's not a back button. But he doesn't know how to use my Android anymore when he tries to pick it up. I'm telling you, it's all about the interface that you're used to. Yeah. Um. So th I think we've kind of already covered this question. Um, my grays go blue. My blues are gray. What background color should I be using? That kind of sounds less like a background color issue and more like a lighting issue. So a lot of times, yeah, when we have those gray, like like blanketed kind of gray look. A lot of times people think that's a color balance issue when really that's typically an underexposure if you're seeing gray. Um, she said grays go blue, but blues go gray. Yeah. I mean, again, with a proper light setup, you're going to have the best potential opportunity to get the best color. Um, there are always going to be limitations with the smartphone camera, though, as far as how they render the colors, just because we have limitations as far as how many values are available. That it, we did kind of already answer that. Yeah. Feel free to go back and watch the replay when we're when we're done, because I think that we we have definitely covered a lot of that. Um, Ursula had asked iPhone question. In the camera system settings, there's an option for photo capture Apple Pro Raw like a real camera. Should we turn this setting on for product photos? So I don't recommend it <laughs> just because it's going to create a whole slew of problems in regards to, you know, how you have to edit and all of that. So basically the difference for those of you don't know that don't know on a very basic level raw photos have have no changes to them whatsoever uh your jpeg the photo is going to render render it for you so raw is going to give you the best potential for color accuracy all that kind of stuff but like i said it comes with a steep learning curve um the only time i typically recommend it to my students is if we're having a really difficult time getting color accuracy but here's the the caveat to that too y'all Smartphones have so many display options now, we can only control so much on our end. And while we want to do the best that we can to make our products look true to color, there are so many display options that alter the true color of a display. We have no control over how somebody else is setting their display, whether they're you know, reducing white point or they're removing the, the blue and using night mode and they, you know, the screen looks super warm. Um, there's only so much we can do. So I also tell my students like, don't stress over it so much to where you're having to like learn this whole new thing or go out of your way to do something just because you're afraid it's not complete. Now, obviously, if it's completely different looking, like, we want to address that. But we just want to do as best as we can, because, again, we have no control over the way people are actually viewing, viewing our products. And I know better not to use any of those display options, but the common person they probably utilize them so that they don't put strain on their eyes and all of that, which is going to create, you know, some issues. Yeah. Um, Jade asked, I take all of my photos outside with natural light, not direct sunlight, because my shop is all very earthy. Will this challenge help with taking photos outside or just inside? I, I've actually done one shoot since taking light, and I definitely feel like it helped a bit, though, um, you know, there were, there w was a couple parts that were more oriented around indoors. So yeah, my examples, and this is something to keep in mind, my examples are typically going to be indoor 
they are going to be with natural light. They are going to be smaller products that fit in like a 24 by 24 type setting. Okay. But I teach principles. So everything is adaptable. It's adaptable to shooting outdoors. It's adaptable to using artificial light. And again, I want to remind you the really, really big benefit is that I am there to support you. So any question you have, because I do understand that a lot of times people like to see their exact scenario or they like to see their exact product. And as you know, a creator, as a coach, that is insanely hard to do because there are just so many scenarios, so many different products, so many things that can come up. And so it's really important that you participate in something that offers that kind of support, because if you are setting up outside and you're like, okay, I watched today's lesson, but I don't necessarily know how it applies to me in my scenario. This is my scenario. You can post that to the group and I will do a full critique and I will give you the advice on how to um, adapt it to your specific, specific problems. Yeah. I do want to add and I think we discussed this a little bit yesterday during E-Rank Q&A as well, is that, and I feel like my course is very much the same, and this is not directed towards, you know, you specifically, person who commented. It's just something to be aware of. We have to also make sure that we are understanding the differences between I can't versus this is hard and inconvenient mm -hmm. because, you know, Sometimes the very best thing that you can do for your business is the thing that is a little bit more hard and inconvenient, whether that be, you know, scooting a TV stand out of the way so you can utilize the very best window in your house. I, I did my or photography setup um, after taking light in front of my storm door on a freezing cold day. Mark comes upstairs. He's like, you got to close that door. It's freezing. And I'm like, I can't. I'm taking photos. Um, but I got the very best results from doing that, you know, granted my butt was sore from sitting on the hard floor doing, you know, my, my session, but I ended up with really great photos. Um, so just make sure that, you know, you're being open-minded about the idea of being adaptable with the potential gains in mind. That's always my thing is like, a lot of people are like, what if it's a waste of time? Yeah, but what if it isn't? What's what's the best possible scenario? And I don't remember where or when I heard this, but I'm going to tell you right now it was life changing. So I want to share this quick. The language we speak to ourselves is insanely powerful. So I was in, and I don't remember a specific scenario, but I do remember that I constantly said to myself, I can't, I can't do this. I can't do that. Um, I don't have, I, let's just stick with that. And I saw something, this was years ago, where it said, change your language. Instead of saying, I can't, because we can do anything. The possibilities are endless, y'all. Like, <laughs> with enough determination, we can literally do anything as humans transition that language and say, I'm not willing to. And if you can sit right now and be honest with yourself and say, instead of saying, I can't say, I'm not willing to, we have like a big storm coming. So hopefully, I don't know if you guys can hear that wind. We're almost done. We just flashed the light flashed. Um, sorry. It almost feels like a tornado. <laughs> like I'm getting a little freaked out here. <laughs> um, so ask yourself, instead of saying, I can't do this, every time you say can't, stop yourself and look at the scenario. Because what you're really saying is I don't see enough value in doing something hard to see a specific result. And if yeah. it's not worth it for you, then that's perfectly fine. A prime example is I am saying all the time, I don't have time to work out. I can't, you know... I can't spend an hour a day working out when really the reality is, is it's, I'm not willing to make it a priority. It's not the most important thing for me to focus on right now. And that's okay. But you have to ask yourself, you have to ask yourself, is this going to hinder me from reaching the goals that I want to? Because words are powerful, y'all. And when you say can't, you are, you're, you're voiding it. You're saying that it's not a possibility and that's just not true. You just aren't willing willing to do what needs to be done to get those results. And you're the only one that can decide if it's important enough for you to make it a priority or not. 
That's that's so true with dieting and yeah, you know, Mark and I, we were in the bodybuilding scene for several years. We don't look like it now. Um, but if you go way back on my Instagram, you can find some pictures. Um, but that's something that you're supposed to say where if you're at a family gathering and you're offered something that you're not supposed to be eating, don't say, Oh, I can't eat that. Mm -hmm. Um, say, you know, I choose not to. You're right. I, I choose not to eat that. Or, you know, that's that's not something that I'm willing mm -hmm. to eat. And it's, you know, or I don't eat that. So it, it really does help. But guys, it's 1.30 on the dot. Um, with so many of you here, there's no way that we can get through all of your questions. However, Christina Nicole is in the Facebook groups. She's in the Handmade Alpha Facebook community, which is linked down below. Um, if you have questions, there are several posts about light in the group that Christina's already commented on just so she can kind of keep track of them. If you have questions for Christina, comment them on those posts. You know, I've, I've made several of them. Comment your questions on those posts and, and, she can answer them. And if you're a student in Handmade Alpha Academy, obviously she's in the student campus as well. Um, Christina, before we go, Light is open until Sunday night at basically midnight, 11.59 p.m. Midnight, yep. Yeah, because if we say midnight, then people will be like, midnight, Sunday, midnight, Monday, midnight, what day? What day? It's, you know technically midnight Monday, 11.59 p.m. Sunday, Eastern time. Um, it's $37. There's a link you know, down below this video in the description. There's also a link to Christina's channel. And we had a great video on Tuesday where Christina came and answered some common questions that you can watch if you want something quick and digestible. Um, other than that, is there anything else that... I just want to mention quick that it does not open back up for enrollment until September. I only yeah. offer this twice a year. So September 30th is when it will open for enrollment again. Now I won't have access to the live chat after this. Will I to respond? Yeah, you will. The replay chat should be there, but I can't respond in it. Mm -mm. Okay. So like Starla said, you can either post on a thing, but I would love to answer any questions that got overlooked today. So either go back to the, the replay of this and post them in the comments of the actual video and I will 100% be in coming back to this video and checking for your questions there and getting them answered, or I'll answer them inside any of her communities as well. But if you have any questions, just let me know. And thanks for letting me hang out with you guys today and let me take up space in your, in your time. And I appreciate y'all. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks so much for hanging out. We will be back next week with I don't know what. This Tuesday's video, I'm I'm diving into something different. You'll have to let me know if you like it. I'm very iffy iffy on on the subject matter because I feel like it's something I like, but I feel like it's something that you guys will think is too nerdy. But I'd like to start making more videos about the you know, the psychology side of marketing. So I'm going to be covering a couple quick psychological triggers uh, this Tuesday. If that video is interesting to you when it comes out please let me know in the comments or you know like the video if you don't want to comment on it because that's how i really gauge whether or not i'm going to make more videos like that mm. so if you enjoy it you know watch it i know some of you guys have specifically requested more psychology based videos so that's what we're talking about but um mr moore i don't i don't know how to turn the bean off how do i turn off the bean are we going to cue the funky lo-fi beat? On oh, we don't cue the funky lo-fi <laughs> beat on Friday. We play Mark's pretty song that he made. How do you do it? You click end. End? Yeah, that will cut it immediately. Okay, we're going to go. We're going to end. All right. Bye. 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 <laughs>